Hey everyone, and welcome to another video here at Whiteboard Doctor. Thanks for joining us today. Quick disclaimer before we move on, none of these videos are intended to be acted upon as medical advice. Please pause the video here and read the disclaimer in its entirety before moving on. Channel plug, here at Whiteboard Doctor, our mission is to bring you interesting, relevant, and understandable medical education for all types of lifelong learners, trainees, and practitioners. If you want to follow along, we do have a lovely subscribe button in the bottom right-hand corner of all the videos. Don't forget to hit that like button. And lastly, if you'd like to support us outside of viewing our videos, we have several ways in which you can do that linked in the video description and pinned comment. Stay well, keep learning, and back to the video. All right, today's discussion is going to be a little bit more of an advanced discussion on, you know, the physiologic changes after intubation. I'd say the video is more so targeting, you know, both students and trainees and providers in healthcare. Now, obviously, we encourage anyone with an interest to, you know, check it out. There's always good things to learn, but we just wanted to lay that out there. So we're going to be talking about the hemodynamic changes that occur after a patient is intubated, focusing on the right side of the heart the lungs, and the left side of the heart. So to start with, we're going to talk about the right side of the heart. And it's probably easiest to, you know, start to grasp this by understanding what the right side of the heart is doing during normal inspiration. So when you take a deep breath in, right, that diaphragm contracts, the thoracic space gets larger, air flows into your mouth, down your trachea, into your lungs, because you're decreasing your intrathoracic pressure. And that decrease in into thoracic pressure is what allows air to go into your mouth, into your trachea, down in your bronchi, and into your lungs. The other thing that occurs, though, with a decrease in intrathoracic pressure from a vascular standpoint is you get decreased right atrial pressure, right? If you picture it, that heart is sitting in the thoracic cavity, right? So there's your heart. You know, you have your lungs there with your heart, and all this is, you know, boxed in by your thorax. So when you take a deep breath in and those diaphragms contract and you're decreasing your interthoracic pressure, that's going to be pulling, you know, outward and thus decreasing your right atrial pressure. What that will do is increase the venous return to your right atrium because the pressure in that right atrium is going to be lower, so blood can flow more readily to that right atrium, and thus your right ventricular, right, from right atrium down to right ventricle, right ventricular end diastolic volume will be increased. All right, we've got an increased arrow there. And that's during normal inspiration. During mechanical ventilation, right, that is exactly opposite, right, because when you give a mechanical mechanically ventilated breath, instead of decreasing into thoracic pressure and letting air flow in, you are giving a breath forcefully. You're increasing the pressure. And as such, when you increase the intrathoracic pressure with a mechanically ventilated breath, you're going, so I should clarify, increase in intrathoracic pressure occurs with high tidal volumes on the vent and high uh, peeps. So high tidal volume is the amount of air you're pushing in. If you're pushing in more air into that enclosed space, you're going to increase the pressure there. PEEP is um, an expiratory pressure. It's the amount of extra pressure you're providing those lungs to try to keep them open. So when you're increasing the intrathoracic pressure, your right-sided preload is going to decrease. Preload is the amount of blood that is flowing into the right side of the heart, right? Because the exact opposite thing is happening. Instead of decreasing your intrathoracic pressure, you're increasing it. That's going to increase your right atrial pressure. And since you have an increased right atrial pressure, you're going to have a less venous return to that right atrium. So mechanical ventilation, we'll highlight it, decreases right-sided preload. Now, there are some caveats to this. And this is, you know, the answer is it decreases your right side of preload, but it's more complex than this. So when you're mechanically ventilated and you're pushing in all that pressure and you're increasing your intrathoracic pressure, you actually are also increasing your intra-abdominal pressure because you're pushing those diaphragms down into your abdominal space. As doing such, you actually somewhat shunt that abdominal venous blood flow back to the right side of the heart. 
So the answer is that you're decreasing your right-sided preload because you have less venous return, but there are some kind of multifactorial things to consider because you are shunting some of that abdominal blood back up to the right side of the heart given the increased intra-abdominal pressure. So just something to, you know, think of, but the textbook answer is decreased right side of preload. As for RV afterload, this is the what the right ventricle has to pump against to get blood to the lungs. And that is usually increased because typically you have increased pulmonary vascular resistance, the resistance of the blood vessels in the pulmonary space, aka the lungs. And we're going to go into that next. All right, so what happens to your pulmonary circulation? Well, this is a graph that you'll see in many, many textbooks. And it's looking at pulmonary vascular resistance, right? Pulmonary vascular resistance, which is PVR, versus lung volumes, specifically the residual volume, functional residual capacity, and total lung capacity. The RV is the volume in the lungs with max expiration, whereas the total lung capacity is the amount of air in the lungs with max inspiration. And what we end up getting is this graph here. And in this graph of pulmonary vascular resistance, you have to divide it up into the alveolar pulmonary va vascular resistance and extra alveolar. Because there's two different types of blood vessels. One are the alveolar blood vessels, which we kind of denote here in blue. And these alveolar blood vessels lie right on the alveolus, right, the air sacs. But you also have these extra alveolar blood vessels, which are here in red. And these extra alveolar blood vessels go through kind of the extra alveolar space. They're not sitting right on top of those alveolus, and they're affected differently depending on the lung volume. As you can see, for the extra alveolar blood vessels, their pulmonary vascular resistance actually decreases when the lungs are more inflated. Whereas the alveolar blood vessels, their pulmonary vascular resistance increases when the lungs are more inflated. Why does that occur? Well, we do drew two different drawings. This one here is going to be, oops, let me just uh, erase that. This one here is going to be during total lung capacity max inspiration. And this is an alveolus, alveolus, alveolus. And right, you have max inspiration, meaning these are filled with air. And what you can see is that these, these alveolar blood vessels on the alveolus, since the alveolus is filled with air, they stretched, they're very thin. And because they've stretched and they're very thin, they have increased pulmonary vascular resistance because they're stretched out and thin. Whereas when you inflate these alveoluses, these extra alveolar blood vessels actually straighten out, right? Because all these have inflated and they've kind of pulled these vessels more straight. So these vessels, actually have a decreased pulmonary vascular resistance, right? Which you can see here. Total lung capacity decreased pulmonary vascular resistance for extra alveolar, increased for alveolar. And the opposite happens down here, which would be max expiration. So you can see here that the alveoli are all collapsed and shriveled. And when they're collapsed, these alveolar blood vessels here, the blue ones, are no longer stretched and thin. They're nice and plump and bulky. So they have a decreased, so RV, they have a decreased pulmonary vascular resistance during max expiration. Whereas when all this tissue collapses, the extra alveolar blood vessels in red collapse and get all tortuous and kinked. So they have an increased pulmonary vascular resistance during max expiration. Does that make sense? If there's questions on that or if that's confusing, definitely let us know in the comments. We're happy to discuss it more. It's something you kind of just have to visit a few times before it starts to stick. So then we have the total pulmonary vascular resistance, right? Because that's going to be alveolar plus extra alveolar pulmonary vascular resistance. And it follows this curve. So your lowest pulmonary vascular resistance is actually at the FRC, functional residual capacity. And this is just, you know, the the time in which right after you've just had a normal expiration, not a max expiration, just a normal expiration. Whereas the PVR is higher during max expiration and during max inspiration. So the pulmonary vascular resistance is variable. Overall though, with 
increased tidal volumes, meaning you're getting higher air pushed in on the ventilator, your pulmonary vascular resistance increases, right? Because max inspiration with increased tidal volumes, that's going to be your max inspiration. You can see your PVR is highest. All right. And then what happens on the left side of the heart? So this one's a little tricky to conceptually grasp. So with mechanical ventilation that has high tidal volumes or high peeps, you have an increase in intrathoracic pressure, as we've talked about, and an increase in something called pleural pressure. What this does to the aorta, so this is the aorta here. The aorta comes out of the left ventricle, right? This is just the left side of the heart. You have the left atrium, the left ventricle, the aorta, right? So you have mitral valve here. Blood goes from the left atrium to the left ventricle. Then you have aortic valve here. Blood goes from the left ventricle into the aorta. And what the left ventricle has to pump against is the aorta. That's the afterload of the left ventricle. So during mechanical ventilation, when you increase intrathoracic pressure and increase pleural pressure, you're actually decreasing the transmural pressure across the aorta. And that's the pressure on this wall. And this transmural pressure is related to compliance of the aorta. Right? If you have decreased transmural pressure, this aorta can be more compliant and it can expand. And since it can be more compliant and expand, you're actually going to decrease the LV afterload. Because remember, if we go down here, flow, blood flow, is proportional to the radius, that's R, the pressure gradient, and then over, this is just blood viscosity and the length of the vessel. So if our compliance is higher, meaning we can increase the radius, that really increases flow because that's the fourth power. So when you get a mechanically ventilated breath, you decrease your transmural pressure, the aorta, let it allow it to be more compliant and decrease the left ventricular afterload. The left ventricular preload just depends on the pulmonary vascular resistance, right? Because the pulmonary vascular resistance, the blood flows from the lung into the left atrium. So if your pulmonary vascular resistance is high, so you have less blood flow in the lung, you're going to have less LV preload. All right, so that's kind of an introduction summary, the, the quick and dirty on the hemodynamic changes in intubation. Let us know what thoughts, comments, questions you have down below. It is a confusing and complex topic, and we try to kind of simplify it into a more manageable length lecture, but we're happy to dive into more details if that would be helpful. So let us know. Um, check out some of our other videos. We've been doing a lot of COVID-19 content lately, but we've been trying to dabble back into our general medical education content as well. Um, we'll link a few uh, related videos in this video's description, too, so definitely check those out. Um, otherwise, subscribe, follow along if you feel inclined. We appreciate you all. Uh, stay well, keep learning, and we shall see you all next time.